Ugh. I'm so frustrated with my microphone. Why? Well, I don't know why it's not working. Dude, planned obsolescence. They want you, <laughs> <laughs> they want you to get the, the new version, dude. All right. Um, taxes? Can you do can you reach can you introduce the topic without mentioning the words tax calculator? I think that's a fantastic way to start the show, Tom. Uh so as as everybody knows, there uh the Republicans and, and and to a much 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 lesser extent, the Democrats are involved in rewriting the nation's tax code. One of the promises that that President Trump and the Republicans have made is about changing the tax code, overhauling the tax code, reducing taxes for everyone, reducing taxes for corporations, and and doing all this to sort of kickstart economic growth, right? And don't so, forget about closing loopholes. He promised a lot of loopholes closed. A lot of loophole closing. A lot of loophole closing. So for the last, you know, for the last, I would say, not even month at this point, the uh, the the public has been hearing the debate on on the tax code. And so, so far, we have a Senate bill and we have a Republican bill. And this bill, j- just to be clear, affects, you know, 150-ish million tax filers. And the, the Republican bill, in the House at least, has, has passed now, has passed the House of Representatives without having a single hearing. And this has kind of been one of my recurring themes on our show is sort of the importance of process, which is that if you're going to do something that impacts so many people, you should – you should really kind of debate that, and you should allow there to be enough time for members of the public, including the press and just the general citizenry, to understand what it is you're doing, to see if they like what it is you're doing. And so both the House bill and the Senate bill have a lot of provisions that that impact regular Americans, and they do that in different ways, right? So one of the ways in which things – one of the ways in which you can change the tax code, and this is just sort of maybe a, a five-second high-level overview of the tax code, which maybe everybody knows, but it's just sort of a background thing, is you can change the rate that individuals pay. So that's that's one major thing that you can do. You can change the rate that corporations pay. That's, again, another major thing that you can do. You can change the tax brackets for individuals as to at what bracket of income or rather what the rate is at at what level of income. And then the other thing that you can do, which maybe is the thing that's most interesting to me um, and to maybe 44 million other Americans who itemize their taxes, is what they do in terms of changing the itemization of taxes. So what will happen to you in terms of uh, being able to deduct your property taxes, let's say, if you pay property taxes, or mortgage interest if you have mortgage interest, or kids, uh, deductions related to having children if, if, if that's something if you have children, or deductions relating to, to so many uh, other things, whether it's charitable giving or retirement accounts or any of those other things. So th- this is the general overview of what messing with the tax code really looks like. When people say they're messing with the tax code in a good or bad way, that's sort of what they're doing. Well, Ruch, so what, what what actually passed the House? What are some of the high- highlights of what passed the House? I'll, I'll focus on the parts about the, the deductions, and you guys can focus on some of the other stuff since I seem to care more about the deductions. So the, uh, the itemized deductions, one of the things that changed is a cap on – uh, mortgage interest deduction. So on a going forward basis, if you buy a house that's worth more than $500,000, uh, the the amount of mortgage interest that you will be able to deduct is as if the house uh, had been worth $500,000. So that's that's one thing that I think – it's interesting. There's a lot of policies here in the House bill that overwhelmingly impact, let's call it blue states or people that are that are maybe more upper middle class than, than absolutely middle class, right? Um, so, you know, if you live in California or most parts of California, you know, a house that costs more than $500,000 is, is a pretty common phenomena. The same thing is true if you live in New York and increasingly it's even common if you live in a lot of parts of Texas. Uh, one of the things that the bill does not do is it does not actually index that to inflation. You know, house prices will, you know, probably continue to go up, but that $500,000 cap will stay the same. So that's one thing that it does. Um, and, and the, the practical impact of that is that if you are a person that's looking to buy a house like that, the benefits to you of buying a house have, have gone down. So that that's one of the maybe less debated areas in this bill is sort of what it does to homeowners and to, and to homeownership more broadly. Um, another thing that it does is it caps 
the amount that you can deduct um, of your state and local uh, property taxes. So th- the House bill caps that at $10,000. Now, if you live in a high property tax state like Texas, there's a pretty decent chance that you pay more than $10,000 in state, local, and property taxes. Uh, we don't have income tax, but we have pretty high property taxes. If you live in New York or California, again, or Massachusetts, you have state income, state property, and you know state sales taxes. All of those sort of benefits that you got for having paid those taxes, the idea was that, listen, you paid the taxes once to your state government. You shouldn't pay them again to the federal government, right? Which seemed honestly like a pretty damn conservative idea to me, which is you shouldn't be double taxed. Now that's going away, at least above $10,000. Uh, another thing that's uh, the, the the standard deduction is going up. So I've, I've you know listen I've talked to a lot of of, uh, of people that I know about this, some friends, some coworkers, folks like that, and you know these are I don't think any of us are what you would call wealthy. I think you would call you know most everybody that at least that's on this podcast, if not a lot of our listeners as well, is upper middle class, right? And you know we're we're very fortunate and we're very lucky, but. You know the estimates that I've talked to with people with kids that have tried to do the back of the envelope math and some in actual Excel spreadsheets is this is going to raise taxes for them. You know, b- between you know five and twenty thousand dollars, depending on the number of kids they have, depending on how much their house is worth. And I- I'm not talking about the hedge fund millionaires and billionaires here because they're they're going to see a tax cut under this bill. So okay, so if if there are all of this this extra revenue being generated by by taxing all of these people, does this bill increase or decrease overall government revenue? So it'll decrease overall government revenue, and it's going to do that. Well, where's all the money going? They're raising all this money. Where's it going? So corporate taxes. Corporate taxes are going to go down from thirty five percent to twenty percent. Uh, also, we're going to move to a. I, I forgot what the term for this is. So maybe you guys know the term, but is it? We're moving to an international tax system, corporate tax system, instead of a territorial tax system. Is that correct? Am I, did I get that right, AJ? Do you know if I'm using the term correctly? I think that's right. So the idea is is that you'll only get taxed in the future if you're a corporation and you earn income in uh, France, for example. You won't get taxed on that income you know, in the United States, even if you're a U.S. corporation. So that's going to create a whole new pool of taxes that used to come to the government or at least could come to the government um, that will not be coming to the government. So, again, that's a that's a pretty big deal, right? So the vast majority of the benefits of this tax plan that the Republicans in the House have passed are going to go to corporations. And the argument is that that is somehow then going to flow back to regular Americans, uh, which I think has just never proven to be true. It's just actually there's there's zero basis, in fact, as far as I've seen, for that proposition that if you cut corporate taxes, wages are going to go up. I mean, what will definitely happen is profits will go up. But in, in fact, like there's been lots of I've seen lots of like um, I, I've seen it, it, I, I read about um, and maybe I'll have to find the link for this so we can put it in the show notes. But I read about how uh, Gary Cohn earlier this week had was doing a roundtable with a bunch of CEOs. And he said, how many of you – he said, show of hands, how many of you are going to increase um, you know, capital investment or hire more people because of this tax plan? And like two people in the entire room raised their hands, and Gary Cohn was like, come on, more of you, raise your hands. Yes. <laughs> and so – you know, uh, and I think this is because the Republicans like – you know, they just – they must understand this, but they must not care, or maybe they don't understand it. But corporations don't make investment decisions – Hardly based on taxes. They make investment decisions based on demand, which is like, do I actually have more customers? You know, do I actually have a new product that my customers want to buy? And if they do, they make that investment. You know, Um, if customers have more money in their hands, then they spend more money, right? Uh, And if they if they spend more money, then that makes sense to go build a new factory or to go hire more people. And there's just the the bill the bill doesn't do that. Having, having corporations pay a lower rate does not do that. It do, all it does is increase profits. And increase pro, I think there's this idea that if you increase people's profits, they will then go and reinvest or you know hire people with those profits. A lot of time they just pocket the profits. Like you know, in the case of corporations, they could do dividends, they could do share buybacks, um, 
And those are not, I, I don't think those are dirty words. I think in the press, a lot of the times you're like, oh my God, they'll just do share dividends and, you know, they'll do buybacks, share buybacks and dividends. You know, there's nothing wrong with them doing that. It just doesn't help the economy. It probably has no impact on the economy. So, so uh, a couple folks have measured, there have been measurements of the Senate version of the bill and of the House version of the bill. I'm dropping into the show notes a table created by um, uh, Brookings, uh, Brookings Tax Policy Center. Um, let me drop this in real quick. But basically, you know, in, in 2018, um, under the House version, in 2018, a lot of people see um, basically basically like a fairly modest tax cut, um, you know, in, in 2018 and in early years. By 2027, almost all of the benefits to, to uh, anyone uh, under the 90th percentile for for income, that benefit goes away. There are, the the tax cuts are extremely modest on on average for people at different income levels, and in fact the the majority of the the, the benefits only get better and better for the top one percent and the top point one percent, whereas year by year the benefits get worse and worse for everyone who's not in the top one percent. The Senate version of the bill, um, which is even worse, by twenty twenty seven, every uh, on average every income group below um, seventy five thousand dollars a year every income group actually experiences a tax increase over a 10-year period. The reason why is that, um, you know, the, the Congressional Budget Office has scored the House version of the bill as increasing the budget deficit by about $1.4 trillion. And so as, as, part, of a, as part of a pay-for, um, some of these, these tax credits, some of these tax cuts have to expire. And the tax cuts that they've chosen to expire are the ones that, that, um, that benefit uh, – middle and lower income individuals and the ones that they want to make permanent are the ones that benefit corporations and the wealthy. So for the house bill, the, uh, the CBO has scored, has scored it at increasing the budget deficit over a 10 year period by 1.4 trillion, uh, additional debt service, uh, for that 1.4 trillion, uh, makes that figure actually a $1.7 trillion addition to the, um, to national debt. Uh, it's about 6% of us GDP. Uh, which is which is crazy. It's an astounding amount of money to give away solely to rich people, uh, or almost solely to rich people, depending on the version of the bill you're looking at. It's an astounding figure. But but here is the thing that I think no one is talking about, and well, I guess folks are talking about it because I've heard it, but no one on the show has talked about it yet. And this to me is the most astounding thing. Uh, this is a part that to me makes it extremely clear that Paul Ryan is just a fake wonk on TV. So there's something called the Paygo Law. Uh, this was passed during. Can I can I interrupt for one second, AJ? Yeah. I agree with you that Paul Ryan is a fake wonk. Yes. I've concluded this guy is a moron. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I mean, Paul Ryan, like, Paul Ryan that is he's a, actually a complete idiot. So Paul Ryan like, is a fake I, wonk. I, I used to, I, I think fake wonk isn't strong enough. I think he's a complete moron. Here's how I judge that he's a complete moron, or one of the ways in which you can judge that he's a complete moron. One is the way that you're going to describe, which is not understanding, you know, in a completely you know, related effect of what you're doing. Here's a, here's another way. It is proposing a bunch of policies that don't actually achieve the goals you say you want to achieve. Oh yeah. So it, th that's a good example of that. You're a moron, right? Because like one, so it's one thing for me to say, listen, I don't like the policies or a liar. Yeah, sure. It's one thing for me to say a moron or a liar. Right. But it, it's, it's a, you're, you know, or that I just disagree with you, right? Because I could say, listen, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of your fiscal conservatism. I just want us to like, you know, run up the deficit, right? I, I could say something like that. Um, and you could say, no, that's a bad idea. And we could just have a policy disagreement, right? But let's say you said, no, what I actually want to do is I want to reduce the deficit. And what I actually want to do is I want to encourage people to get off government programs. And then you propose policies that will do the exact opposite of both of those things. Uh, yeah, I guess either you're a liar, as Tom says, but I'll give Paul Ryan credit. I don't think he's a liar on this regard. I think he's just a moron. I think he actually does not understand what the effects of his policies will be. And that's something that is, is very frustrating to me. I'll speak to both of those points. The first point is that if Paul Ryan is, is, trying, to actually, uh, is trying to actually get a bill passed, he's got two big problems. First of all, this bill is not reconcilable. 
Um, reconciliation is, is when a bill can get through the Senate without a filibuster, and in order to be reconcilable, among other things, it has to not increase the deficit over a 10-year measuring period. That's why the, the CBO scored this over a 10-year period, and it's a $1.4 trillion with debt service, $1.7 trillion increase to the deficit. And so th- this bill is not reconcilable, and the Republicans, I mean, it's, it's definitely objectionable enough to be subject to a filibuster. So first of all, this isn't even a bill that will pass. So if he's trying to if he's trying to actually enact legislation, he has failed. Second is that there's something called the Pago Law. Uh, the Pago Law was adopted early in the Obama administration, and it was a, it was basically a law that said we're never going to do anything like the Bush tax cuts again. And so, it when um, a, a bill passes that would have uh, uh, impacts on the national debt over a certain threshold, or on, on the budget deficit over a certain threshold, there's something called an automatic sequestration. And so the Office of Management and Budget, by law, is required to analyze um, analyze changes in law and determine if a mandatory sequestration will be required. And so what is a mandatory sequestration? Okay, so there, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in our budget process, there's mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending is things like the social safety net, so like Medicare, Medicaid. These are mandatory spending, right? These, are, these create positive rights for people to, to claim benefits from the government. So that's mandatory spending. Okay, so if this bill, the CBO has scored the uh, House version of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and uh, what they've said is that the um, there will be there will be a required sequestration of about one hundred and thirty six billion dollars. Um, the the cuts, to, so that means that that the Office of Management and Budget just just has to find one hundred and thirty six billion dollars of mandatory spending to cut. Uh, the PAYGO law limits reductions to Medicare by four percentage points. So $25 billion of the $136 billion will come from Medicare. So automatically, the government will be required to reduce Medicare by $25 billion. Uh, okay, so that's $111 billion left to be sequestered. Uh, well, the CBO says that there's only about 85 to $90 billion available in mandatory spending that could possibly sequester, be sequestered under the law. So basically, there is not enough mandatory spending in the government to fulfill the PAYGO requirements for this bill. Paul Ryan wrote a bill that cannot be legally implemented with, I mean, with, without drastic cuts to the social safety net beyond existing uh, cuts that are available. So Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, right? I mean, isn't isn't that what their their end goal is? No, but but they like like there there is actually not enough available money that's eligible for se- sequester to pay for this bill without those cuts, right? No, 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 no. You don't understand. There are not enough possible cuts. So the Office of Management and Budget is required to sequester w- without Medicaid cuts, though, no, or no, without no. Medicaid, Social Security. No, 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 or... no, 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 no. You don't understand. The, the PAYGO law says that certain categories of mandatory spending aren't eligible for being sequestered, right? So you can only sequester about four percentage points of Medicare spending, right, for example, right? So there's, there's more than $136 billion in mandatory spending, but of the amounts available for sequestering, right, of the amounts that actually can be cut, there is not $136 billion available for sequestering. It is, it is not physically possible to implement the mandatory PAYGO spending reductions that are the result of this bill. Like, I, I know what you're saying, like, oh, like, their goal is to reduce Medicare and Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera, but there actually isn't enough Medicare and Medicaid funds available for sequestering to implement this bill. So does that mean, so if, pay, if PAYGO can't be, so hold on a second, if PAYGO, if the PAYGO law cannot be complied with, okay, does that mean that they, uh, they can't that, that this law cannot become law, or does it just mean that they will have to amend the PAYGO law as well, or what does it actually mean? No one knows what ha- I mean, I don't know that anybody really thought about what would happen if there wasn't enough spending available for PAYGO sequesters. Mm, interesting. Th- that's kind of a big deal. But I think, I think this is crazy. Like Paul, like, Paul Ryan wrote a bill that actually cannot be implemented. Like, it can't pass the Senate. There's no point in doing this bill. The bill is, like, massively unpopular. Is it, though? Is, is it massively unpopular? It pulls, like, 25 – it pulls, like, 25 points underwater, right? It's something like 26, 4, 50-something against. I didn't know that. It, I mean, it's just crazy. Right? It's, it's massively unpopular. It's, it's hugely unpopular, particularly in districts that Republicans are going to need to win to keep the House after 2018. And it can't legally be implemented. It has no chance of passing the Senate in current oh, wow. form. Um, 
It's just crazy. Dude, it would have to. It's crazy. There would be there would there would have to be reductions to other programs, including farm subsidies. Oh my god! Yeah. Good, good luck. Good luck. The so so I put a um so I'm gonna cite a bunch of some interesting things, and the citation is in the uh, is in here. But I thought I thought there I thought we just spend you know so the Republican so this House tax bill cuts five point nine trillion in taxes, right? And it creates. What's the amount of new revenue here? Um, well, one and a half trillion less than that. Four point four, f- yeah, four four and a half trillion of new revenue, right? So I thought it might be fun to just take two seconds and say, okay, well, what are some of the things that they're doing to create new revenue? Okay, so um, here's an example. So they're doing things to uh, to education spending. For example, let me find this real quick. Sorry, guys. Okay, while we're just looking that up, one last point. Steve Dennis, who um, is a reporter who works on the Hill, I forget what publication he's with. Um, he said that most senators that he talked to this week, um, most of the senators had no idea that the Congressional Budget Office has said that there's going to be more than $100 billion in automatic entitlement cuts, uh, including $25 billion cuts for Medicare. So most senators are just completely unaware that uh, that is something that will result from this bill, um, which is kind of interesting, right? Like, it's totally crazy that, that people that, – that this is something that Congress can do without really knowing it. Oh, Steve Dennis is with Bloomberg, by the way. Anyway, go on, Rich. Hold on. There's, there's one thing on education, which is about $48 billion. It, it takes away the deductibility of student loan interest. So if you have student loans and uh, you pay student loans and you get a deduction on the interest that you pay for your student loans – uh, you will uh, you will no longer get that. One other thing they're planning to do that's similar is that so uh, PhD students they um, they get paid in in two form yeah they get paid in in two forms uh, by the university. So first of all, they get a tuition waiver. So let's say uh, I'm a PhD student at a university, annual tuition is like fifty thousand dollars a year. So that tuition is waived. So I, I don't have to pay fifty thousand dollars a year in tuition. And then they give you like a stipend. They, let's say you get eighteen thousand dollars to live on, and you don't. You don't have to pay fifty thousand dollars of tuition. So your total compensation for being a PhD student um, is sixty eight thousand dollars. Well, right now tuition waivers are not taxable income. So you'd only actually pay taxes on the eighteen thousand dollars that you take home. Uh, the Republicans have proposed to make the entire sixty eight thousand uh, dollars taxable income, and what that means is that you can you can actually get paid eighteen thousand dollars a year and pay taxes as though you're earning sixty eight thousand dollars a year. And it's just nuts. It's just crazy. I mean, it, it's just punitive. And and all of this is happening without two critical things: one, public hearings, and two, a tax calculator. One other thing worth mentioning is uh, Dylan Matthews at Vox wrote uh, what I thought was a pretty interesting article. Um, I'm not going to go through it line by line, but uh, what the headline is: the Republican tax bill is far, far, far worse than it had to be. Uh, and Dylan Matthews's point is that there's basically a better way of doing each of the stated goals that um, that Republicans profess to have. I would highly recommend that like people um, people read this because honestly, before AJ put this in the show notes and before I read this article, I honestly didn't know about all of these other things that had been proposed, and maybe you guys did, um, but I didn't know for you know for example that uh, you know Ben Cardin had a a progressive consumption tax act right, which would exempt the first hundred thousand dollars of income for couples from income tax, you know. Um, and that he'd consolidate the rates to three, 15, 25, and 28%. And he'd cut the corporate tax rate uh, to 17%. And he would introduce what's called a value-added tax, which is similar to a, a, a tax that they have in Europe. But the entire thing would be deficit neutral, like completely revenue neutral. Anyway, these are really interesting sort of policy ideas that, you know, honestly, I hadn't read in kind of my my news coverage, my news consumption. So. I, let me second AJ and say everybody should read this article in particular, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, one one other, I think, um, in, interesting effect that, that Paul Krugerman has noted is um, is sort of what, what are going to be the effects of, of the House proposal on, um, on a budget deficit and trade deficit. And basically, uh, so the, the Tax Foundation, which is – we'll talk about that in a second, but the Tax Foundation is, is – uh, basically a, a think tank. It's it's funded. I, I find the tax foundation to be pretty good. I, they do they get some things wrong, but I I think they're pretty. So they're probably a little right of center, but I, it, it's not like they're the heritage foundation or you know what I mean. Like read read this Krugman article and then and then still say that. So basically, yeah, I did. I I, I still think it's okay. 
what they're saying is that, oh, there's going to be so much foreign investment, and that's going to be a huge, huge uh, increase to GDP. And so the, the dynamic effects of the bill, that is the, the effect of the bill on GDP growth, will, will help pay for the bill. Okay, so here's what they're saying. Uh, they're saying that there's going to be something like, like uh, 3% of GDP in additional foreign investment. But like what Paul Krugman is, is saying basically is like, first of all, that, that would basically double our current trade deficit. And that second, all that foreign capital will earn a return, right? So people, people invest money expecting a return. Um, so what, what Paul Krugman's point is that almost all of the GDP grant, uh, gain would accrue to the foreign investors, and it wouldn't actually increase U.S. national income, even though it would increase U.S. GDP. So you'd basically be in an Ireland situation. So like Ireland has exactly this problem, right, where, where they uh, have, have positioned themselves as, as one of the best tax havens inside the EU, and so a lot of folks like Apple will, will have um, a corporate office there so that they can, they can uh, nationalize their income in Ireland and, and achieve like Ireland's tax rate. And then and so Ireland's GDP sh- shot way up and their actual national income, the amount of money that, I, that people in Ireland earn, uh, didn't shoot up. It was, it was just paper wealth. It was paper wealth for foreign people. So I think that's kind of interesting, right? I, I, I haven't looked at the statistics in Ireland in particular, but I have looked at like Ireland as like investment climate and Ireland as just like, you know, just the economic growth in Ireland. And and Ireland is booming, right? Like Ireland is one of the fastest growing countries, you know, probably in the world right now, but certainly in, in the Western world and certainly in, in Europe. And it's been that way for seven or eight years. Now, I, I, I don't know if that's because of their tax policy changes, but I, I think it does, you know, tons and tons of companies are opening Ireland offices. And they're not just, you know, these aren't like kind of offices in Bermuda or like, you know, in off, in offshore tax havens, right? These aren't like, you know, two-person offices. These are like, they're hiring tens and thousands of people. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't say anything that broad about the Irish economy. At least I don't agree with it just based on my own reading in terms of how, um, just how hot Ireland is and like how much capital investment, how much like new housing is being built in Ireland, how much new office space, you know, um, how many new jobs are being created? So, well, anyway, you can. I mean, their their GDP is growing, and growing. Um, their national income is sort of not quite growing with their GDP. Which so national income is how much money people in the country make, and GDP is is how much um, how many goods and the value of goods and services produced by the country. And so, if, so does that? So, do you get credit for exports then, or no? Yeah. So exports. I mean, exports inc- increase your GDP, right? It, exports increase your GDP. But if but they may not necessarily increase your your national income. But if there's going to be some amount of money that's used to hire people in that in that when you invest money in the U.S. So like if you build a factory in the U.S. right like let's just say that like you know you you make a hundred dollars of goods in the U.S. and thirty dollars of that is profit and you take all thirty dollars of that profit and and take it back to Malta but the seventy dollars in wages still right occurred, I don't right? Think, I don't think we're disagreeing with each other what I'm saying is that the the return to foreign capital increases domestic product but not national income their analysis doesn't account for for it doesn't it doesn't account for the increase in the trade deficit and it doesn't account for any of the return earned by the foreign investors so so they are vastly overstating the dynamic effects of the bill okay so i think dynamic effects are bullshit anyway so let me not you know kind of i don't have an argument with you there i, th- I think all this dynamic modeling is is pretty much just bunk um I mean, I think you actually agree with Krugman, just not the specifics, but the actual conclusion you agree with. Yeah, I agree. I agree with the conclusion. I, I just think this specific example is maybe not so great. Anyway, okay. So one one other thing worth mentioning about is that the, in the Senate version of the bill, this isn't in the House version, but it is in the Senate version. Um, they are, are proposing to eliminate the individual mandate. So now it's a health care bill. Again, it's a health care bill. It's terrible. Uh, the CBO has done an updated score in November of this of 2017. They did an updated score on what repealing the individual mandate would look like. Um, talk about this. Uh, federal budget deficits would be reduced by about $338 billion. Um, the number of people with health insurance would decrease by $4 million in 2019 and $13 million by 2027. So $13 million fewer people with health insurance. Um, average premiums in the non-group market. So non-group market is basically people who don't have employer insurance, uh, but people who who are buying insurance in the individual market would see average premium increases of 10%. So this is bad. This is bad policy. This is not good policy. It, um, one of the one of the craziest things about this this particular issue is that the the talking point among conservatives is like, oh, you know, we're not kicking people off of, of our insurance. We're not, um, you know, we're not actually 
uh, increasing premiums or we're not reducing Medicaid spending. And but but that three hundred and thirty eight million dollars in, in reduced federal spending, they're you know, they're claiming that as a pay for in their version of the bill. So they're basically saying we're not cutting spending, but we are claiming the benefits of these saving cuts. So, you know, um, I think that's terrible. I think it's a terrible policy. I think it's not going to be popular. And uh, tax reform is sort of already unpopular enough. But to turn it into a health bill after the you know great success of the last time they tried to do a health care bill, uh, I think is pretty dumb. Anyway, the, um, the big senators behind this proposal are, are Rand Paul and Tom Cotton, which gives you a sense of um, sort of ideologically where that's coming from. I think it's I think that's pretty so I couldn't figure out if um this entire thing like from just a political strategy perspective of putting uh repealing the the Affordable Care Act's mandate uh that everyone get health insurance was like a stroke of brilliance or just like completely and totally stupid. Totally stupid. Totally stupid. For, from a strategic perspective, right? And so like so so here's why I thought okay Maybe it's brilliant, right? Maybe it's brilliant. Here are my here's my reasoning. Okay, I, I actually don't think it is brilliant, but let's just let's just let me, here's my reason is maybe what you do is you convince like Susan Collins and like you know I don't know all of the, the three or four senators in the middle that frankly are just going to decide this entire thing uh, that this is the chance, this is the last chance. It you know sure it takes away the mandate, it raises all this new money. Um, you know, maybe it causes the health insurance markets to fall apart. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but at least they – at least it's not like cutting Medicare spending or taking away, you know, preexisting health care coverage or any of these other things that are, like, extremely popular, right? Because, like, you know, the mandate is not extremely popular, right? Um Yes, you know, care for and, you know, do most people even understand that without the mandate, you can't have a sustainable insurance market or a sustainable like at least as it relates to preexisting care coverage? Yes or no. I don't know. Right. So maybe maybe you do a final rallying cry. Now, in many ways, it's it's like really, really stupid because now you could have got I mean, theoretically, you could have gotten some Democratic support for this bill. Now you can't. Like the minute that you turn it into a health care bill, like now you're not going to get a single Democratic vote. Whereas before, hypothetically, maybe you would have gotten like, you know, Manchin's vote. Maybe you would have gotten like a couple of other like, you know, I don't know, just some like Southern Democrats or like or, you know, sort of Midwestern Democrat votes. And it, now now you're definitely not going to. And then I thought, like, surely they wouldn't have proposed this without like running it by like Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins, because that would be stupid. And then I realized, yeah, they're not very smart. So <laughs> they probably didn't run it by anybody before proposing this. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, neither Collins nor Murkowski has actually said that that they support the bill yet. Um, so yeah, they they always they always hold their cards pretty close, you know. And this is yeah. I mean, I, I think a decent amount of this may turn on, you know, this is just my view on if Roy Moore gets beat. And if he does get beat, by how much? So let, if he doesn't get beat, I think Republicans will see that as like a decent sign that you know Trump has more power over them than their fear of swing voters. If he does get beat, they won't necessarily think the opposite, but they won't feel the need to vote with Trump to the same extent, you know, as if Roy Moore actually um, actually loses. That's my thesis. It's probably worth explaining for a minute exactly what the mechanics of indivi- of repealing the individual mandate are, and so so here's how it works. Right, the ACA is is, is a three legged stool. Uh, three legged stool. Three legged stool. According to John Roberts, is a three legged stool. So here are the three legs. Uh, first of all, everyone can get health insurance. Right. So there there is community rating and guaranteed issue, and both of those are fairly complicated. But in short, what they mean is anybody who wants health insurance has to be able to get health insurance. There has to be right. There's, there's insurance companies are no longer allowed to say, actually, we don't cover you. Um, doesn't matter how sick you are. It doesn't matter what your preexisting conditions are. The, there has to be some health insurance policy for you. The second issue is that um, everybody has to buy insurance, right? And that's the individual mandate. So everyone has to buy insurance. If you're sick, you have to buy insurance. You probably want insurance. But if you're well and you don't feel like you need insurance, too bad. You still need to buy insurance. And the third leg of the stool is affordability. 
So everybody can get insurance, everyone has to get insurance, and everyone can afford insurance. So there's a huge expansion of Medicaid, which is free if you're eligible. There's um, and a huge number of tax credits that that say for for a whole bunch of folks, your the amount of money that you have to spend on your health insurance premiums can exceed a certain proportion of your income, and the government will make up the difference by giving you a bunch of tax credits. Right. So those are the three legs of the stool. Uh, everybody can get insurance. Everybody has to get insurance. Everybody can afford insurance. The uh, the reason for the second leg of the stool, why do we need um, everybody to get insurance? Well, if you're, if you're risk pool, if the pool of people who have health insurance are only sick people, right? Um, and with guaranteed issue, all sick people are going to want to get insurance, right? If, if the risk pool is mostly sick people, then you'll end up with, you'll end up with a, a really expensive product, right? It'll be very expensive for insurers to provide insurance. So what do they need to do? They need to broaden the base of people who are paying into the risk pool. And you do that by getting healthy people and young people to, to get health insurance. So young, healthy people have to get health insurance. That is the individual mandate. Even people who feel like they can roll the dice and they're young and they don't expect to have any health problems, they have to buy health insurance. And they have to pay premiums into the system, and that decreases the average cost per rate payer of obtaining health insurance. And so by repealing the individual mandate, there will be two effects. First is that a lot of people who might have actually wanted health insurance, just won't get it because, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, I mean, generally, like, e even, if, even if something is, is actually a benefit to you, a lot of folks just fail to opt in, right? Think, I mean, think about every time you got a coupon in the mail and just forgot about it until after it expired. Right, like every time you had like a free burrito at Chipotle and you just like didn't bother to show up to Chipotle to get your free burrito. But what if you had been mandated? What if you had been mandated to get that burrito? So if the government said we're going to come and charge you a bunch of taxes if you don't claim your free burrito, a lot of folks are going to claim their free burrito. Which sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. But there are tons of people who are eligible for Medicaid. It would, it would have no cost to them to obtain health insurance and they still don't do it because they just fail to opt in. And so one of the things the individual mandate does is it, it is an extra incentive for people to opt in for something that is unambiguously a benefit to them. The second thing the individual mandate does is it says, young people, you can't skip out on the system. You have to join the risk pool, even if you would prefer not to have, have health insurance. So even people who – these are not people who fail to opt in. These are people who would have chosen to opt out. Too bad. You have to get health insurance. And when those, when, when those two groups of people exit the system, as we were talking about, the risk pool gets worse. Right, the risk pool becomes more expensive for insurance for insurers to cover, and they have to raise premiums on the people who remain in the pool. Um, and so, for all of those people who drop out of the system, the government saves about three hundred and thirty-eight billion dollars, and the people who are left in the system have to pay a lot more money to obtain health insurance. So that is that is the effect of the policy. That that is the thing that the Senate version of the health care bill would like to have occur in the world. Tom, what do you think? Sounds bad, dude. Sounds bad. And they want to do all this without giving you a convenient way to calculate your taxes as to what they would be under this bill. Like you just think that someone, you know, would create a little calculator that said, here's what your taxes will be. And so you can make up your own mind, right? You don't have to like go and look at all these, you know, studies on, you know, what the, what will happen to the average taxpayer, right? I mean, what do you really care about? You know, you, of course you care about the country, but you also want to know what's the impact on me. Yeah. So, uh, is it worth talking for like a couple of minutes about why this is happening? I mean, that just descends into cynicism, AJ. I actually don't. I don't think it descends into cynicism. I, so, I actually like. So, like, uh, we, we should put this in the show notes. But, but Orrin, uh, Orrin Hatch, the chair of the Senate um, Finance Committee, he actually like had a little outburst at Senator Brown from Ohio. He had a little real outburst at him. So, Sherrod Brown was saying that, oh, you know, this is just a bill that redistributes wealth from the poor to the rich. And Orrin Hatch said, you know, c cut out. Uh, all of that. I used to be poor, and I'm doing this to help people, and I spent my whole career helping people. And I think a lot of people have sort of um, – I think there are, like, really sort of two possible takeaways. Like, one, Orrin Hatch is lying, or two, Orrin Hatch is dumb. And, um, you know, I think it's worth asking yourselves, like, like are – are Republicans lying when they say that everybody's getting a tax break when, in fact, not everyone's getting a tax break? Or are they dumb? And I think the answer is yes. Um, I think some Republicans are lying and I think some Republicans are dumb. I think most people in office – I mean I don't know. Maybe this is like a uh, controversial opinion. But I think most people in office, Republicans and Democrats, actually go into office meaning to do well. Um, but I think that, that Congress is so starved for resources and congressmen – uh, have particularly congressmen, but also senators, have so many demands on their time relative to their, their resources. They, they, I mean, they don't. 
they, no one has time to go and sit down and listen to our podcast and really think about the impacts of their bill or, or dig into, you know. It's about priorities, dude. It's about priorities. I don't, I don't want to hear all the shit from Orrin Hatch and from all these guys that are like, I, I don't know. I, I agree. So I agree with you to some extent that it's really hard to know about all these things. But I think at some point you have to say, listen, if I don't know about these things and I'm not going to take the time to know about them, then I'm going to deliberately slow down the process to make it so that I can know about it. But Paul Ryan goes on TV and, and he says every American's going to get a $4,000 get a $4,000 raise because of the flow through effects of the reduction in corporate income taxes, right? And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders gets on TV and says every American family is on average is going to get a $4,000 raise as a result of the flow through effects of the reduction in corporate income taxes. And you're a congressman who ran for office on, you know, uh, some other issue like oh I'm I'm like a big foreign policy person and people elected me to really care about foreign policy and I don't have the the resources in my office to have a budget person like a tax person and a foreign policy person, um right like like I think a lot of people just sort of defer to the leadership in their own party and when Paul Ryan goes out there and says things that are demonstrably false and like who are you you know like like who are you supposed to believe so I I actually think that most of the people who vote for this bill really think people are going to get a four thousand dollar raise. I think they're wrong, and I think Paul Ryan is responsible for 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 them being wrong and having wrong beliefs. But I don't think that they're like malicious. Yeah, I don't think they're malicious either. So I've been listening to that Al Franken audiobook, um, which has been really good, by the way, and which I still recommend people listen to. But he says that in order to be a successful Democratic center, you have to hold these. I don't know if you've heard this part, AJ, but he says you have to hold. Um, too frustratingly, you know, too frustrating beliefs, right? Or two two beliefs that contradict each other. One is that, you know, what the Republicans are trying to do is to benefit the wealthy and what you must do at all turns, um, you know, is to fight them. And then the second belief is that the Republicans love this country as much as you do. You don't have the monopoly on the truth. And they are sincerely trying to do things that they think will be good for the country. And in order to create good outcomes, you do need to work with them. So he talks about how like there's this contrast between like you have to fight them at every turn, but you also have to work with them at every turn that's possible, you know. Um, and I think I think maybe that's I I don't know I thought that was like a pretty that was a pretty good way of putting what it means to be in that type of office. Yeah, I mean, put to the side for a minute the question of whether Frank will still be a senator this time next year. Um, I think I think that like that point that point regardless of who made that point is is like genuinely a good point and yeah and actually let me let me let me spend five seconds talking about Al Franken um, and comparing him to Roy Moore because I think there's a you know obviously what he did was wrong he should not have done it and I think that I think the way that you're judged in these situations is twofold one what's the wrong thing that you did and then second what is your sort of reaction to the wrong thing that you did. And, you know, do you take personal responsibility or do you not? And how do you take responsibility for those actions if you do take responsibility for those actions? How do you take responsibility for it? And I think in the case of Roy Moore and Donald Trump, the answer is you don't. You don't take responsibility for it at all. Uh, You attack the accusers. You call them liars. um, And in the case of Al Franken, you admit that you were wrong and you call for yourself to be investigated. Uh Um. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I've got one little side topic in the show notes that I think would be interesting to talk about. What's that? Uh, the Australian government is is presently rocked by scandal. So the Australian constitution says that that members of of parliament can't be dual nationals. Uh, so anyone who's got dual citizenship is disqualified from being elected to the parliament. Uh, and what the the Supreme Court recently said is that, or I guess the High Court recently said is that. If you were a dual national at the time you were elected, even if you later renounced your second citizenship, the actual election itself was invalid. So you have to resign from from parliament and you can run in the next election. But until the next election, you cannot run for parliament. So here's this crazy article, uh, quote, having literally clung to power by its fingertips, the frailty of the Australian government has now been finally exposed after it lost its single vote majority following the Deputy Prime Minister being declared ineligible for Parliament. So Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce is one of seven politicians uh, affected by this high court ruling, and she uh, she found out that her father was a Scottish citizen, and she's a, a citizen of the UK by descent, which means she's a dual national, meaning that her election to Parliament was invalid. And now 
the government has lost its majority making vote. And so the, the government of Australia uh, may have to go down because of, of this bizarre constitutional provision. Isn't that crazy? I don't cry for Australia myself, but... I think this is nuts. Nobody got my joke. Isn't that, like, totally crazy? Dude, AJ, I've already moved on to sidebar. I'm already looking at Tom's sidebar. A little background into my sidebar. My sidebar is um, a couple of links. One is to the Longevity Illustrator, and the other is to a PDF called uh, the U.S. Life Tables, published by the CDC. And it is all uh, this immense data on... um, basically how long individuals are going to link live. Um, and so I, 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 I decided to do this sidebar today because yesterday was uh, AJ's 29th birthday. Is that correct, AJ? Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. So according to the CDC, AJ has a probability of dying this year in his 29th year on Earth of 0. 0.0013. Three seven three. Nailed so basically, it. Basically, seems kind of high, dude. No, that's good. Seems kind of high. A, well, he ha- he he has a tenth of a percent of a chance of dying this year. He has forty one forty nine point one remaining years left on Earth, which means uh, how many? Forty nine point one years left that on Earth. That doesn't seem like that many. Well, it's not. Life is short, dude. Life is that's short. like not even eighty years. Yeah, life is short. Well, he has 49.9 years from today. So that's like 80 so that's 80 years. Like not even yeah. 80 total. Why yeah, is roughly. AJ's life expectancy so low? Life is short. 80? Yeah, life is short. He for a white man, it's even shorter for minorities. What about for dude, that's not like 80? I this this doesn't this doesn't you know, like go with the longevity illustrator, dude. So just, just, yeah, just take a, just take a look at the, the CDC. Uh, the CDC has great data, but uh, you know, if you calculate it out, um, it, it means that AJ will die on Christmas Eve, Friday, December 24th. Um, dude, Tom 20. Oh shoot. I missed the date. I had the date here. And there isn't anything for us Asian people, Tom. Uh, yes, there is. There's white, black, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, black. We're not either of those. No Asians? I no. I, I thought they had data on Asians. Also, this is 2013 data, dude. I'm not trusting anything yeah. that hasn't been updated since the Trump presidency started. Well, so you have to understand that, that the uh, CDC data is based on census work ah, I see. Um, as, as well as you know Medicare work. So they, uh, they do their big updates – after each census, basically, but they do have sort of mini updates from time to time in the interme- in intervening period. But yeah, it, it, you're gonna you're gonna find the best data in relation to the census. Um, and so the last census we had was 20, 2010. and so in roughly twenty twenty three, we should see a a uh, update, which will hopefully will increase AJ's life expectancy. Oof. I hope not. The world is too cruel to stand for too long. AJ, you're just being dramatic, dude. I have a good sidebar. Mm. What's your sidebar? Uh, Mark Fraunfelder uh, wrote an article a couple weeks ago for Wired. I think he's one of like the founders or he's one of the senior editors at, at Wired.com. Um, but he forgot the password to $30,000 of Bitcoin. Well, so what he did, this is a crazy story. You should read the entire story. It's like very well written and the narrative is very good and there's a lot of dramatic tension. But basically, he... Um, he bought like a thousand dollars of Bitcoin, and um, or he bought three thousand dollars worth of Bitcoins, and he uh, put them in a in a in a hardware wallet. So it's basically an extremely fancy USB stick, and he wrote down the passwords for for getting the information off the USB stick on a piece of paper. And then one day before a flight, he left a note for his daughter. He's like, "Oh, like if this plane goes down, I want um, I want my daughter to be able to access our Bitcoins." And so he took the piece of paper out of his desk drawer. And he uh, left it under his daughter's pillow. And a couple weeks later, he was like, oh, I wonder where that piece of paper is. And it turns out his, like, his, his uh, cleaning lady had thrown away the piece of paper. And so now, now he had no way to access the Bitcoin on, uh, on his USB stick. And it increased in value until it was like $30,000. And so he um, – anyway, I don't want to like spoil the ending. I don't want to tell you whether he ever actually got access to $30,000 worth of Bitcoin. But you should read this article. It is it is totally nuts. It's totally crazy. Uh, you like sweat along with the author. 
That's tough, dude. Dude, so my sidebar is on the topic of taxes. And uh, <laughs> it's actually the most do you, useful thing. Do you thing. understand what a sidebar is? This is just bar, dude. Richard. This isn't a sidebar. <laughs> this is just bar. Dude, this one's great. Um, this is every tax cut and tax increase in the House GOP bill and what it would cost. And this is on the New York Times website. And it's it's really like kind of some – like you know there's a lot of different things here right so how do you how do you create this soup there's a this you know this complete mess that is the the house gop tax plan and it's you do a lot of different things like you repeal the exclusion for qualified moving expense reimbursements which raises 6 billion dollars <laughs> then you repeal foreign based company oil related income and that costs you 3.9 billion dollars okay then you <laughs> extend ter- temporary increase in limit on cover Cover it, cover over of rum excise taxes in Puerto Rico, which costs you zero point nine billion dollars. Then uh, you repeal the exclusion for employee achievement awards that raises three point eight billion dollars. Uh, you limit the exclusion of uh, employer paid gyms, and that raises two billion dollars. So right now, if you're working at Google or Facebook or anywhere where there's an employer provided gym. They get to deduct that expense, and uh, they won't be able to anymore so, in this tax. So, so that's why our uh, office landlord put in a gym. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and can I just say, it's I don't like that gym. I mean, yeah. I don't know if anyone from uh, my office landlord uh, is, is landlord agency is is watching, but what sort of gym doesn't have any treadmills? I mean, what what kind of bizarro world are we living in where you think I'm going to put in a gym, but let's not put in any treadmills? Tom, have I have I ever ex- talked to you about the outside God's treadmill? You can just walk anywhere. No, dude, you can't. Dude, here's another thing. Here's another thing that may impact some of you folks. Repeal deduction for employer provided transportation and parking. That's going to raise eleven billion dollars. So you know. Oh, dude, this is an actual tax credit. This is a tax change I found that I actually like. Gosh, it's really small, though. There's this thing called the New Markets Tax Credit, um, which I could we could do an entire episode on that. Uh, but that raises $1.7 billion when you get rid of it. This is actually good. So there's one good thing in this bill. It's only $1.7 billion out of $5 trillion, but or 6 and a half, But, you know. Anyway, this is pretty cool. I, I, the only thing I wish this had... Which, you know, New York Times, if you're listening, is like a thing that clicks through to the actual provision in the tax bill so you could like actually read it. You should send an encrypted WhatsApp on that, dude, to their tip dude, line. I've, dude, I've sent them so many tips that they have refused to investigate. It, so I found out that at least the Washington Post actually read my tip that I sent them. How, how did you find that out? Well, so there's the double blue check mark on WhatsApp when they've actually read it, whereas with oh. the New York Times, they haven't even read it. There's no double blue check mark. Um, okay, I'm going to order a new microphone, and it's going to arrive Monday, November 20th for $69. Yes. God, that's frustrating. All right. Well, then I'll have a spare microphone. Yeah, but but you should definitely send it in and get it repaired and see if you can get a free uh, credit on Amazon. Yeah, dude, Amazon shouldn't be selling you things like this. They shouldn't be. Amazon doing this should to you. stand by their product, and the microphone maker should stand by their product. Yeah, dude, I agree. I mean, it hasn't you, even been a year. Yeah, this is about standards, dude. So it's got. This is it's about got standards. A, I mean, I think it's got a lifetime warranty from Audio Technica. So I'm just going to send it back to the manufacturer and get them dude, to fix it. That's going to take years for you but to get I'll, your money back. Then I'll have two you microphones, to to... right? Because one, I'll have like a spare. Because you know, two is one, one is none. But also, like, if we ever interview someone, we'll have a fourth mic. Dude, I was telling Tom about I was telling Tom about how surprising it is that you don't have um, more microphones. Like you have seven iPads, you know, twelve um, iWatches, four MacBooks between just for you, and then another four for Lily, and then two for Jonah, and yet only one microphone. It just seems odd. Well, I think it's because it's not an Apple product. If it was an Apple product, then you'd have Apple microphone ones through seventeen. Maybe uh, Apple should start making microphones. Not a bad idea. You should send them a you should send them a tip, AJ, on their anonymous tip line. I mean, they put. I mean, they probably sell more microphones than anyone else in the world. They're they're the world's largest camera seller. Probably, yeah. But yeah, every I- iPhone does have multiple mics. Yeah, yeah. I sort of wouldn't be surprised if Apple was the largest seller of microphones in the entire world. 
if, like, every iPhone has one camera, and they're the largest seller of cameras in the world. And every iPhone has like two or three microphones in it, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they're. Dude, how do I upload this, AJ? There's no, um, there's no folder. Oh wait, eleven nineteen Thanksgiving special. Okay, I'm gonna upload this. I'm gonna stop recording and I'm gonna upload. All right, later, y'all.